again. Just to uh, conclude, the Chavetz Chaim speaks about the whole concept of taking a personal accounting. But a self-accounting, you know, very often, just in real life, just as Shlomo says, regarding acquiring fear of heaven, does it come easy? It's not so simple to have a sense of God's presence in your life. So Shlomo Melch explains in Mishlei, in Proverbs, in Kesef, <clears throat> if you desire it as one desires silver, and you search for, search for it as you search for tre buried treasures. <clears throat> Person, he works, he dedicates his whole life financial success and especially if a person can't make ends meet and he knows that earning a living is survival and if you have the same desire for this as you desire silver a person's a treasure seeker you find people spend they put their lives in jeopardy to find treasures buried treasures which they believe may be whatever may be if you invest that degree of interest and effort and initiative to seek out a sense of who God is, then you'll merit a divine assistance to have a sense who God is. Then you'll understand what Yir Shashem is, what reverence for God is, what fear of God is. Only if you have that desire, so the way I understand it, besides the concept of divine assistance, a person who his whole drive in life is to succeed. Every waking moment, even when sleeping, at a conscious or subconscious level, that is embedded in his emotion, in his mind. All he thinks about, at a certain level, his eyes always open to notice opportunity. Doesn't miss. And if he should miss it, he berates himself. How did I miss that opportunity? A person who's driven to success and a person who's a treasure seeker, he invests endless money sometime in, in a pipe dream or the likelihood of him finding the treasure is the chances more not than yes. So if a person wants to create an emotional mindset to understand and it sends God's presence, you have to have that same desire and same drive and same interest. Because firstly, the interest is, I want to have a sense of God's presence. I'll give you an example. Every morning in the Amida, the bracha after the endowment of understanding, intelligence, discretion, we ask Hashem, God, bring us back to your Torah, the Karvenu Malkin of Vosecho, and bring us back, our King, to your service. We say it in the morning. That's the blessing of tshuva, of repentance. Hashivenu Avilu Sosech Karvenu Malkin. Karvenu Malkinu La Vosecho. Ba'azrein B'shuva Shleimo, and it should be a full tshuva. When you say that blessing, how in touch and how sincere and how to what degree do we really want it? Where's God? Bring us back to your Torah. We've chosen, we're far away. We want to be brought back. Bring us back. Bring us close to your service, our King. And what kind of return should it be? A complete return. Is God can bring us back where in a moment we're out the door again. So it has to be said with a sincerity. So first and fore foremost, it's the purity and sincerity of the person's mind and emotion. To what degree do you want to be brought back? I'll give you an exa example. A child is estranged from his father and as a result of being separated and not having all the amenities which he took for granted and the love and the security that he took for granted and now being estranged and being all alone, bereft of all that, he realizes the mistakes he made. So when he comes to his father and he first writes the letter 
and he asks his father would he consider taking him back. He writes that letter with a degree of remorse and sincerity and purity and communicating to his father how unforgivable it really is the way he behaved. It's only because he didn't appreciate it. When the father sees this, it touches the father. Because the father sees bringing the child back, he will appreciate and do his best to act as a son to a father. So we say to Hashem, we've gone astray, we've done many things, we behaved as if we make the determination. We are the creators of our own success. We determine our life. And therefore, we made many mistakes. Inadvertent, deliberate, defiant, whatever it was. God, bring us back to your Torah. What, why to the Torah? Because as we said many times, the only antidote to control and to incapacitate the evil inclination is only the Torah itself. So bring us back to the Torah. Meaning that's the study of Torah. An appreciation for what that gift is. It's like a person is given an, uh, an antibiotic, which the, it's the only thing that could arrest the bacteria. person doesn't appreciate it. Puts it on the shelf, eventually it goes lost, they can't even locate it. You call up the doctor, you know, I was a fool. I didn't even make the prescription. And the other prescription I did make, it became, it expired and it was thrown out. I feel the effect of that bacteria, it's intensifying. It's taking over my life. I beg you, please write me another prescription and give me a pharmacy where I could fill that prescription. Otherwise I'm at a, at a loss. Bring us back to your Torah. Give us that antidote. Because without that, I'm at, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm lost. The And through that, will be our king will be brought back to your service. And to what degree do I want to come back? I want to fully come back. So when a person goes and he makes that personal self-accounting and you begin realizing a person runs a business, sales are booming, but he doesn't realize if he takes his overhead into account and the 20% that his employees steal from him, plus the merchandise that he can't sell out and becomes and the supplier doesn't take it back. You think you're making money, you're losing money, and your storage, and the insurance, and everything that goes in it, in, into it. Every one of us believe, even when we're doing the right thing, we're way ahead of the game. But if you go and you evaluate and see where you're at, we're playing behind the eight ball, as they say. There's plenty to correct. We can do things a lot better. There are many oversights. So only to be in touch with the reality of where we stand, to be able to advance, you really have to make this self-accounting continuously. Every night, every, at the end of the week, once a month, and at the end of the year, before Shoshana and before Yom Kippur, we make this self-accounting, that we should be in good standing and not, God forbid, not knowing when that last moment may be, and you'd be caught by surprise where you can't cut cover your debt. You don't want to you don't want to be caught with a debt that you can't, which is uncontendable. And you have to pay endless interest on that debt. And it's very painful. Not only that, we say in Pirkeovos, Avera Goreras Avera, that one sin brings another sin. When a person does chuva, repents. It actually, it dispels it as if the sin doesn't exist any longer. And not only that, it converts it into a mitzvah. Because, because you recognize the wrong that you have done, it's converted into a mitzvah. So when you do tshuva, it even encourages other mitzvahs based on the principle one mitzvah brings another mitzvah. But let's say you're not aware that you have the sin. There's a problem, you're always going back to that same problem and you don't know why and you can't figure it out 
But if you do the introspection and you make that evaluation, then you realize where the problem lies. Because until you locate it, you have the principle of Avera Goris Avera. That spiritual deficiency or that spiritual bacteria is only encouraging more. It's festering. And when it festers, it brings more of the same. Therefore, the value of focusing and making an evaluation of where I'm at and where I'm not at is so basic and crucial to put yourself into a better position. Yesterday at Shalosh Shodis, it was a woman here, very good woman. We had a conversation, spoke, speaking about the pandemic, that the amount of people who died on a worldwide scale, not only in the United States, and special people died, a lot of good people died. Even people were careful. A person can't be careful enough sometimes. And a person, God forbid, contracts it, and it actually compromises the person's life and the person dies. Knowing this and, and knowing to what degree it's limited and affected our lives on a personal level, on an economic level, on a social level, on a, a mental level, every level we've been affected. On a family level, the people stop to think. Initially, when it happened, people said, you know, this is clearly the hand of God. Can't be denied. There's no stone that you can hide under. Literally, it's to that degree. God forbid, you can't even go in for into the hospital. God forbid, if you, for something else, because you never know what you can track there. And they don't let anybody else into the hospital if you go there. You're left all by yourself. You're left bereft. Since it really, it's, it's really jolting, very much, frightening. What changes have people made in their lives since this pandemic started? It's, it's a year already. You know, we become, we go into this trance. Initially, we're, sh we're shaken, we're, we're frightened, and afterwards, a human being has the ability to acclimate yourself. I remember many years ago in Belfast, they, every day there were bombings there. This is before, you know, I, I asked myself a question. You walk down the street in Belfast, all of a sudden, a car bomb goes off, 50 people are killed. And all the different streets there. I mean, how do people maintain their sanity with such a level of stress and worry and fright? How do you, how do you live? But somehow, people, they survived. People have the ability to acclimate themselves to the worst conditions. If you don't have a way to resolve it, you, you lulled into it, somehow we put it in perspective and you get used to it. And it's only an incident in your life. That's all, it's an incident. It's not your life. You don't let it to take over your life. Of course, if you let it take over your life and especially if you have no solution, you can't survive. So man, God created a human being with the survival instinct. We can survive anything. God forbid, even the worst circumstances. If, especially if we can't contend with it, we go into survival mode. Sometimes you have the concept of the, the state of amnesia. If the human emotion and mind cannot deal with certain traumas, you know what a person does? God just wipes out the whole record. The person has no recollection of that. He loses his identity. Of course, it's become the trauma is so all-consuming, overwhelming, a person can't deal with it. It's the same idea. The ability, the human instinct of survival is that if we can't contend with it, we put it on the back burner. But what about subconsciously, the key, what's first and foremost is survival. If that interferes with survival, it doesn't resonate in my emotion, in my mind, it's off to the side, that's all. But factually speaking, how many people have made changes in their lives because of the pandemic? None. Nobody is, well, who's made changes? Have I become a better, I'm not even talking about as a Jew. Have I become a better human being because of the pandemic? I think 99.99 to the nth degree, nobody's made an iota of change in their life as a person. I'm not saying financially, we have to deal with things differently, work-wise, family-wise, 
You have to maybe get a therapist for yourself, for your wife, for your kids, maybe that. But in terms of quality of human being, our belief in God or our quality of character has really changed. Not as much as an iota, nothing. And I said years ago, at the time of the Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein was shooting the Scuds to Israel, the Scud was so destructive and devastating, God forbid, if it would have fallen into a populated area, the casualties, these would have been disastrous, catastrophic, besides the material destruction of this, the buildings and everything else. Every Scud that was shot landed in an open area, no human casualty, no material destruction loss. It was miraculous. That's what it was. It was frightening. And they had no control. This is before the Iron Dome. They couldn't even shoot the things down. And frightening. And it came out, and I mentioned this in the past, Saddam was shot 39 scuds. So the whole talk on the west side was, and the east side, number 39, it's interesting. One at 36, one at 45, 39, the 39 creative activities on Shabbos, you're not permitted to 39. Evidently, there's a message here. We have to now draw the message. You know, years ago, they used to have, uh, in most homes, you had a coffee table, and you had a coffee table book. Very large, either they had a stack of magazines, Life, whatever, Cosmopolitan in Manhattan, stacked up. And the other, they had a book, the book weighed about 20 pounds. You know, I don't know what it cost. It's about a picture book about some, maybe architecture, art, whatever it was. And that's what it was. So that was the coffee table book. And then there was the talk at the table. What's the latest? And that was the talk. Especially Shabbos that you would get together, all the, the young singles, young singles of people already in their 40s, that was young singles. And that, that's what we talk about, 39, what is it? The moment it stopped, it's like it never was. Nobody made an iota, of, an iota of change in their lives, nothing. Now, what's the difference between nature and miracle? Nature means it's natural. Day in and day out, things just repeat themselves. Repetition, something which is repetitive, you say that's natural. Something that's out of the ordinary is unnatural. And especially if it's positively out, out of the ordinary, that's called supernatural. That's miracle. So I'd said, if somebody would come and all of a sudden we wake up, you go down to the Atlantic, and all of a sudden, that morning, it splits straight across to Europe. The Atlantic. What do you say? You're awestruck. It's never happened before. God is saying something. You go the next day, it hasn't gone back to its regular flow. And you realize, nature has changed. Until now, the Atlantic flowed horizontally. Now it's split. For whatever reason, we don't know. Do we understand nature? So initially, when you see something to be unnatural, supernatural, you're rattled. It attracts your attention. The moment you see it to be, take on a natural order, it's like it never happened. That's what it is. Now the question is why? You know, change is the most difficult thing in a person's life. We're conditioned to behave a certain way. The change is not a child, that's why it's so important for a parent to raise a child properly with the right values and to direct him and mold the child when he's malleable. Once a person, you know, years ago, I had a relative who was the top pediatric surgeon in, in Baltimore and was an observant Jew. And he said, you know, in those days when children were born, they needed all kinds of things for their feet, special corrective shoes, Sometimes they put a bar between the legs to straighten out their feet. So he explained that when a child is in utero, because the fetus is bent in a certain position and the bones are very soft. So as a result of that, that if based on the position, sometimes the, the, the foot is bent to, or turned in a certain direction. And therefore when the child is born, the, the, the feet are not really in the direction that they should be. But the bones, that since they're still soft, the child is a newborn child, it's easy to really redirect 
So if you put the brace on, you put these bars on, or you put special corrective shoes on, easily you could correct it. Once the bones harden, you can, it doesn't help. You, got, you have to break the bone, you have to do surgery. It's not the same. A child is born, he's malleable, easy. No child, naturally a child is selfish, self-centered. Everything is the child. But if a parent goes and pushes the child, the molds the child in a proper mold, the child could assume very special qualities and characteristics naturally. He's naturally inclined to be giving, to be kind, to be sensitive, to run away from things which are bad, which are cruelty, bad things. But when a person gets older to change, it's, it's painful. You know what it means to, to break a bone? A person has a problem with a back and you have to put a back brace on and the person can't stand straight. And when you took the back brace, every step he takes, he feels he's being forced into that brace. You're in pain continuously. Change is the same thing. We're conditioned to see things a certain way. You could talk about 39 scuds from today forever. The moment the problem passes, it's like it never happened. Why? Because change is like breaking the bone and resetting it. That's what it is. We don't change easily. And that's what it is. And that's why the cheshben nefesh, the personal evaluation, accounting, continuously, we don't let it go to a point of no return because once you set in a certain way, it's very difficult to make the change. You could chip away at it, then you're chipping away at it. But you already have a mountain of problems. But if initially a person is conditioned, every day at the end of the day, I do a self-evaluation, an introspection. As much as I think it was good, could have I done better? And by realizing that, you never let it reach a point where you're so locked into a certain position mental, emotional, inclination-wise, that it's literally an upheaval to bring about that change. Wise, he's out of control. How long does it last? During the war, you know, Jews, Jews are not simple personalities. We find Moshe Rabbeinu refers to us, and Hashem refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, Ab they're a stiff-necked people. A person that has his own mind, he wants, he does things as he sees it. He doesn't bend easily. And that's innate in the Jewish personality. I'm Kshayorifu. You know, years ago, they used to say over, you know, uh, Golda Meir, Golda Meir, when she met one of the presidents of the United States, and uh, the president, it wasn't Eisenhower, it was, wasn't Eisenhower, I forgot who it was, but Eisenhower always had a similar situation, conversation, with the Prime Minister of Israel, and Eisenhower says, and Eisenhower himself was a five-star general, he says, we have so many generals in, in the armed forces. So she says, by us, every citizen is a general. Everybody has his own, his own mindset. It's a whole different reality in Israel. And, that, and, and it's the truth. So before the war, even among the many, many parties in the Jew, among Jews, even the observant Jews, the different shades. Every shade of Jew had another political party. Somewhat to the extreme right, somewhat to the center, somewhat to the left. Multiple parties. And everybody was literally at each other's throats. Gaining, even though they meant well, because they felt their position was the correct position. Then Hitler, Yemach Shemo, came into power. He started to institute, bring about genocide. Jews were sent to concentration camps. When they came to the concentration camps, all the differences all of a sudden evaporated, disappeared. There was a tremendous unity. It was everybody was for everyone else. If anybody could help anyone, because there they realized that if we're not for one another, it's over. The only chance of survival, we have to be committed to one another. Otherwise, it's over. Mentally, we will be destroyed. Emotionally, even physically, it's questionable. But if a person despairs, Mentally, emotionally, you die. You cannot survive. And there was tremendous unity. Right after the camps were liberated by the United States or by England, and they were put into DP camps, displaced, displaced persons camps, immediately, immediately, the moment they had, they were given their barracks or whatever was in some clothing, 
and the, the, the government offered certain rights or certain, they could request what they wanted, immediately they were back to their old shenanigans, back to the original. You're me and I'm I, and I do what I want. I have the right way, yours the wrong way. And all the bickering and the inf infighting started immediately. Immediately. Where did it come from? It was suppressed for a few years, like you never saw it. You thought this is brotherly love. No, it was circumstantial love. The love was based on circumstances. Each of them had their own mind, their own idea, their own direction. And the moment it passes and we, have, we feel we have control and we have opportunity, of course we mean well, that, that's where it goes. And things don't hold together any longer. Things stop coming apart at the seams. It's the same thing with every one of us. You know, it comes before Shoshani Yom Kippur, Baruch Hashem, thank God that to some degree we hear the shofar, they start blowing at the beginning of Elul. So we have a chance to be touched for a month before and a week before Rosh Hashanah, we start saying slichas, the special supplications and during the Aser Shemei Tshuva, the Demiri days, we also were touched and were humbled and we, were, we have a conscience, this and that. The moment Yom Kippur is over, literally, it's like almost Yom Kippur didn't, it didn't exist five minutes ago. We're out of the shul. Fast break. This, that. So where are we going? You're already sending your bags, UPS, down to Florida, to Europe, to Israel, wherever you're going. What happened to Yom Kippur? But again, because that is the, that is the essence of a person. If a person is conditioned to spirituality, the moment after Yom Kippur, you're still holding, you, you have two feet still in Yom Kippur. You don't extricate so quickly. You can't extricate so quickly. It was a known fact. Rabbi Levi Yitzchuk Barditchev, who was the famous uh, petitioner of the Jewish people, whenever he always would pray to God, and he would say, Rabbi Levi Yitzchuk Barditchev, that he would say, the Jews to survive in Europe, he lived in the 1800s. It was impossible because the, the laws were so discriminatory you had to violate the laws of the country to be able to survive. And because there was such discrimination against the Jews, you couldn't survive materially, impossible. So the average Jew, or many of them, were smugglers. You had to smuggle across the border, not to pay the tariff, but if you were caught smuggling, besides confiscating the, whatever, the merchandise, the consequence could be very extreme be beaten up, being thrown into prison, whatever it was. But Jews had no choice. They had no choice, and they smuggled, and they took the chance. Most times they weren't caught, because they would bribe the border guard, whatever. It was. Somehow they worked it out, but still, there was a chance you'd get caught. But they weren't in any way deterred by what? By this threat of being caught. But yet, when it comes to the 14th night of Nisan, when we search out the Chomets, we take homage where's value, leaven products, whatever it may be. It comes the 14th, the 14th day after midday. You will not find a Jewish home that has a crumb, not even under the bed. If you look with a flashlight, you will not find that crumb under the bed. You're not going to find it. Is anybody looking over our shoulder? Are there any physical consequences? God, because when you say to the Jew, you're not permitted to have any trace of leavened product in your home, no Jew does it. There's no border guards. There's nobody looking over our shoulders. So do you, is there such a people in the world? The mortal, they're not, they're not concerned. They're not afraid of. But your word, Hashem, is sacred. The Jew is committed to your word. That's Rav Levi Yitzchuk That's the way he would supplicate Hashem and petition Hashem to see to put the Jews in the most positive light, never in a, in, a, in a critical way, ever. That's the way he spoke. What do you think Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Abadichev would do right after Yom Kippur? He was the, the shliach tzibur, he was the chazan, through all the tefils on Yom Kippur, fasted the whole day. We know that the holiday of Sukkot follows Yom Kippur. What he would do, immediately, he would not break his fast. He would say, he would immediately sit down, Take the tractate sukkah, which all the laws which relate to sukkah are in this tractate, and he would study the tractate throughout the night. And only when he would finish, and he'd finish the whole tractate in one night. He was a great Torah scholar. 
And only after he finished the track date was he ready to break his fast, and then he did. What are you talking about? All you think about from three o'clock in the afternoon on, when, when is this fast going to be over? That's the average person. He, even when it was over, and he stood on his feet all day because he represented. And when he prayed in the way most people didn't pray. Get back to normal. No. It's again because his whole mind and emotion, his whole life was fully invested in his spirituality. He, there was no reconditioning. It wasn't recalibrating. It wasn't recalibrating whatsoever. All of us, we have to recalibrate when we do the right thing. It's a recalibration. But you can't. Because it's something which is only temporary. It's something which is incidental. When you pray, it's also sometimes, it's, an, it's something we do. Or it's an experience. You know, an experience you don't forget. You touched, you don't forget. If you touched, you carry that all throughout the day. But if you're not touched, it's just going through motions, then who are you? You're who you are. That's what it is. So the whole idea of making this self evaluation, this introspection, which the Gemara talks about, it's based on a verse in the Torah. Bo Cheshbo. Cheshbo means in a calculation. Make a computation. Come and make a computation. And this computation is the ultimate computation of a person's life. Is it really worth it? The value of a mitzvah versus its cost. The value of a sin versus its cost. That's what it's all about. And if you, but even if you make the calculation, that comp computation, if a person goes and he's a glutton and he has uncontrollable appetite, he orders the best thing on the menu. But you realize by sending that much on the menu, you're not gonna have much left for other things which may be more important. It's the same idea. The question is, when you make the computation, is it worth it? Person that has a desire to do sin. Is it worth it? His desire is so overwhelming, he doesn't appreciate the cost factor of it. All he thinks about is the, the, the desire at that moment. But nevertheless, you have to, it's a training. It's a training. You have to focus on it. Ultimately, what's the cost? What's the cost? When you do a mitzvah, is it worthwhile? You may not be inclined to, but intellectually, it's worth it because the payoff is infinite. So whatever the cost is, it's a pittance versus what, what you're actually gaining. And, and yet everything in life is continuous making this level of evaluation. You don't do an action unless you evaluate what it is. Nothing is done by rote. Nothing's done reflexively. Could you imagine walking through a minefield and the person strolls like he's strolling through who knows where, through a, through a, a garden, Knowing that every step, you may step on a mind, you, you, you speak, you walk gingerly, carefully, and with tremendous fear. Because you never know what you're stepping on. And let's not talk about a minefield. You walk through a, a, a jungle where there's snakes and scorpions or types of plants which are poisonous that if your foot, you lacerated, God forbid, it could create an infection, ultimately you could die from it. person wears protective gear, goes through, and he's so careful what he allows to touch his mouth or even his lips. Remember many years ago, there was a couple, young couple, and they had wanderlust. His wife loved to travel. And they would go to the far ends of Africa on all kinds of trips. So today the couple lives in Israel for many years, many years. They're there about 30 years, over 30 years. And... Um, the wife, she was into wanderlust. And he was also that type of boy, young man. And they were going down to the Congo. She wanted to go to the Congo. And uh, she wasn't looking for diamonds in the Congo. And um, to go there, where she was going, she had to be inoculated for a few weeks. Because otherwise you could be exposed to diseases and other things there. If you should be bitten by an insect there, that they have type of insects there that we don't have in, in the so-called, in our hemisphere, and you have to take, and even taking the inoculations and the medication, sometimes it has its, its side effects. For, if you have wanderlust, it's worth it. So they went there, 
And his wife, he was more observant than his wife. He was about tshuva, she was about his tshuva. He was much more than she was. And this is after all maculation, the riding on this boat down the wondered rivers in the Congo, and also the boat hit something, and some of the, some of the water, which is infested with all kinds of who knows what bacteria, splashes on her skin, on her skin, on her hand. She goes, she has a meltdown. You understand? It could penetrate the skin, some kind of parasite. There may be parasites in the water. She could die from it. The rest of the trip was a disaster. She was worried she was going to die because some of this water had accidentally gone on her skin. This is after all the inoculation, every, all the protective gear. She's worried. In the sand. Life in reality is no different than that. Every step of the way, you never know. Well, yeah, I'm, af I'm afraid of nothing. You know, I'm a big boy. God understands. How do you know what God understands? Have you ever spoken to him? Have you ever read what he, what he told you? What he understands, what he doesn't understand, what he will tolerate, what he won't tolerate. What do you mean he understands? It's like, you know, a person eating something, not understanding the ingredients, and it may be, you may have an allergic reaction that after you put it in your mouth, maybe you, you may have difficulty breathing. Well, it's okay. I'll take the chance. I mean, are you really serious? Are you responsible? Do you live like a responsible human being? Well, God understands. How do you know what God understands? How do you know what God will tolerate? Only by studying. And even after you study, as much as you study, we're still human. You, we're, humanly, we have natural deficiencies and blind spots, insensitivities. We have an evil inclination, which hoodwinks us continuously. So how do you somehow open those whys? Why and has, see clearly. Firstly, you have to have, you have to know the law. You have to study the Torah. You have to have be acclimated with spirituality. And you have to make ultimately you have to do that self accounting, that what's called introspection. And try that naturally. You should be inclined to do that rather than go against the grain. Because when you go against the grain, you can only go against the grain so much. Ultimately, it has to get easier. If it doesn't get easier then you realize you have a problem. You're doing something not right. I feel, and the Chavetz Chaim writes this elsewhere, you know, today, at one time, the only person who could study, if you were able to read, read understand Hebrew, and even if you understood Hebrew, to study th material that was very um, academic and very profound, you had to have a background. You had to be taught. You had to have an orientation. You had to have, had to have a certain breadth of knowledge even to understand what, what you were actually reading, to have an appreciation. Today, everything, firstly, is translated. Everything today not only translated, it has commentary. The, the commentary is translated. And everything, you have tapes, you have videos, audios, you have everything on the sun, but not only that. The key is today you have biographies of special people, whether they were laymen, whether they were great rabbis, whether they were great Torah sages. And reading these stories of these people, they're very inspiring. Because you see people had certain insights. And because of seemingly having that insight, which the average person doesn't have, all of a sudden it made tremendous differences in their life, whether it's helping other people, helping themselves. I always said, the one who invented the zipper. I remember Rashid Zacharin of Rocha came to the United States in 1929. In 29, and the, some of the clothing he had, I came in the early 60s, where I don't know when he bought some of that clothing. It was literally, you know, those these people didn't buy clothing that often. And I remember all his pants, many of them had buttons. There were those, he didn't have zippers on his pants. He had buttons. The, the pants, the, when it was tailored, they didn't have zippers. Relatively speaking, I don't know when the zipper came, was introduced that every garment had a zipper on it. But zipper, it's, it's not a difficult concept. But the one who came up with the concept, it was ingenious. Because until then, you had to keep two things together. You had to either sew it together or button it together. That's, you know, we don't want, you know, sometimes you have to keep your mouth closed. We said, you know, you should, you should zipper your mouth closed. So you button it closed. You button, why don't you button your mouth? 
Okay? So I'm saying, it's so simple. But you know, until you think about it, it it's ingenious to come up with that. Once you have the solution, now it's not so complicated. You know how to, do, to replicate and duplicate manufacturing this and put it into every type of garment, to hold it together. It's the same thing. Once you get, you appreciate the problem and you focus on the problem, and then you create a program, how to deal with the problem, the problem becomes less of a problem. But if you don't even realize you have a problem, you definitely don't create a problem, a program to address the problem. So how do you know first you have a problem and to appreciate the problem, to create a program to minimize the problem? That's why this introspection is so crucial and basic to be able to grow and correct all the deficiencies and the imperfections that we have in our life and to maximize on the opportunity we have. And that's the reality. There was a person, his name was, he was a great Torah sage, he lived in the 1800s. His name was Rabbi Rafael Hamburger. Why was he called Hamburger? Because he was the chief rabbi of Hamburg. Hamburg, Germany. So he was known as Rafael Hamburg and in Europe. Most of the students in, let's say, the Slabotki Yeshiva, they weren't referred to by their, their uh, family names. They were always referred to their first name and the city they came from. I remember I once mentioned that my father had an uncle who was sent by his parents to Europe at the age of 12 because they understood you couldn't survive in St. Louis, Missouri, in, in 1885, there was no Jewish education. It was much, it was much of a Jewish environment that was conducive to be observant. So at the age of 12, firstly, what he did was he bought a farm and he started a dairy. He did not send his children to regular public school. He had private teachers teaching his children because he didn't want them to be affected by the culture because he understood if they come acculturated, it's over. He will lose his children. So two of his sons, they were a year apart. One, he sent both of them to Europe at the age of 12 years old. Both of them came back at the age of 26 with families. One of them he sent to Slabotka. To Slabotka. He was one of the first people to send children to Europe to study. And my father, Olav HaShon, was speaking to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Zechat Tzadik Levrach, who was one of the leading Torah sages, passed away about 25 years ago. He said when he came to Slabotka in 19, 1910, my father's uncle already had left Slabotka. And his name was Yehuda. In those days, a person Yehuda, they used to call him Yudel. Yudel. That was like a nickname for, for Yehuda. Yudel. So he says he remembers when he came to Slabotka, there was a person who had left. His name was Yudel the, the Americano. Yudel the American. That's the way he was known. That's the way they used to refer to people in Europe. The city was the first name where you came from. Chaim Minsker. The person came from Minsk. He was called Minsker. Chaim Minsker. Right? That's what he was called. The person was called even Rav Chaim Salvechik. His name was Chaim. He was known as Rav Chaim Brisker. He was the chief rabbi of Brisk. He was known as Rav Chaim Brisker. So Rav Rafael Hamburger, he was the chief rabbi of Hamburg, so he was known as Rafael Hamburger, but that was not his family name. So five years before he passed away, he retired from the rabbinate, and he was a phenomenal rabbi. He really advanced the community, his influence was phenomenal, but he said, so people said to him, why are you retiring? You could be rabbi, you're fully functional, you still leave very effective, he says, as a chief rabbi, you have to deal with so much so much stuff. I have to preside over many disputes. I hear so much negativity where people accuse each other. It's inevitable, I'm only a human being. When you hear such negative, you know, I can't be careful enough. I may hear things that I'm not permitted to, to believe. You know, and as a result of that, you know, I don't have many more years on this earth. I have to really clean up my act. And therefore, I want to spend five years not knowing exactly when I'm going to pass away, that if anything I had heard, which I shouldn't have heard, or I had certain feelings or evaluations which are inappropriate, I want to clear it all up. 
I have to ask forgiveness from who I did, what, when. I need three, five years to clean up, clean up my act. You know what that means. He's willing to pass with all the glory. You know, once you retire, your glory is not the same. I don't care how much money a person has. If you're not active, they put you on the back shelf. And you feel like you've been, been actually been put on the back shelf. That's what you are. The kids will call you, uh, Dad, you know, maybe you could send a what, good investment. But you know, what, so what's my value? You're no longer involved in the, in the thick and thin and, and, the, and the fight and the fray. You're not in there. Your whole sense of self doesn't make a difference. My sense of self is I have to be that special person. Special means not to preside over other people and to receive honor. That's what it's about. It's seeing where I'm at and where I'm not at and appreciating where I'm not at and to make sure I am where I should be. That's what it's all about. You can't do that. First, it's a training. You have to be trained you, what you say. You have to be trained to focus. You have to be trained to evaluate. You know, you get an assessor to assess a piece of property. He's, he's, he's trained. He's certified as an assessor, as an appraiser. Well, I'll appraise it. You know, I've seen a lot of beautiful homes. You don't even know how to begin making a proper evaluation to, to make the proper appraisal what the true value is. So you're going to make a self-appraisal on yourself. I am think, I think I'm a great guy. Because I walk into shul uh, an hour and a half late, and I walk in, and they're holding my reading Torah, and I have my lifesaver in my mouth, and everybody shake my hand. I have my uh, psychedelic talus with every color under the sun on it. And I put it on and people look at me because they got to put their sunglasses on because of the lights, when it reflects off those colors, it's like unbelievable. And I'm the hit guy. And when they call me up for, for Birchas Kohanim and I sing the tune, the Notre Dame, their, their football song, which they do in some shuls in Manhattan on Yom Kippur. And that's supposed to be funny. You know, that's what it is. These people, they haven't woken up yet. They haven't woken up. So I'm saying everything is part of an orientation, a training, an appreciation, and that's exactly what Cheshb and Nefesh is. Introspection, person, I've introspected. I think I'm a great guy. What did you look for? You, know, you, you don't even know, you, don't have, you, you have an assay office. Person used to mine whatever it was, precious metals you bring to an assay office. They make an evaluation test. Could you bring a, a, your, your, your precious metal to a person who's, who's in, who has junkyards? He knows copper, he knows tin, he knows iron. Could he, could he evaluate what precious metal is? You have to have special chemists who have the chemicals at the end and the machinery and whatever it is to, to be able to understand the purity of whatever you're bringing. We're not talking about iron over here. Talk about precious metal. It's the same thing. You have to have that expertise to even, even know how to begin Making the valuation. You know, it's interesting. People who have responsible parents and they teach them study habits and they give them direction, good advice, and they treat the child, the child should appreciate what it is. Usually that child, if God wants it, turns out pretty good at the end of the day. Let's say a child's orphaned and he has no one to guide, to guide him, no to raise him. And he's really on his own. He may be special or have special potential, but if there's no one there to really mold him and mentor him and direct him, he's on his own. He sees many things. He may see a lot of good things, may see a lot of bad things. And therefore it's really, it's potluck you want to say. It's, it's more than potluck. God has something to do with it. Because you find people, even that way, they turn out to be special despite why they shouldn't have turned out special. And you find people who have the special parents, they should be special, and they turn out to be not so special. That's what, that's what happens. But regardless, that as they say, you never know, as much as you never know, we still have to live responsibly. You have to live, live responsibly. So as a person like myself, knowing and being trained or mentored, which I was fortunate to have a sense of certain things and because of my level of involvement and immersion for many years in what I do, therefore I have certain sensitivities with other people who don't. But because I do have that sensitivity and every Jew is responsible for every other Jew, 
if I see an opportunity where I can make a difference by sharing something with someone else and communicating it, that's my responsibility. And if I don't, there's a level of culpability and liability to me. You know, years ago, I used to raise very large amounts of money for different Torah courses, whether it's Jewish education, whether it's feeding people, whatever it was. So people used to say to me, I, how do you do it? You go ask people for money? I said, let me ask you a question. First, am I asking for myself? I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking for others, but still, you know, they, you may touch a, you may touch them in a way they won't like it. First, I said, I wouldn't approach a person that I feel the person has no relevance to it. I will only ask a person I feel that he could appreciate what I'm suggesting and therefore I will ask him. But still, how do you do it? I said, look, after 120 years, if actually that person should have been offered that opportunity and he could have said yes and I didn't, who do you think is held accountable? I'm accountable because I didn't ask that person or I suggested to that person or encouraged the person. So therefore, when I ask him, you understand, it's for him. And it is for him. And he could have been a beneficiary of doing the right thing. And I didn't offer him that opportunity. That means I failed. Therefore, it is it's, to a degree, it is for me. But for me is because I'm supposed to be for him. And that's the way. It, and if that is my modus operandi, so to say, the perspective, how to approach people. And that's the reason why I meet a person. Like you have a person who's a tremendous salesman. He has a sense of who that client could be, who that customer could be. I meet a person, I have a certain sense immediately. I go into what to say, how to say, what to, what to bring up, because you never know what could touch a person. It may not, not, but it's there. If I feel I could some way affect a person, I will affect that person, because that's my conditioning. That's my mindset, and that's I feel that's my mission in life, is to affect other Jews to be more sensitive to who they should be. And that's it. But all this comes, but as much as we do it, as much as we think we've done enough, we haven't done enough. And that even, so everybody has to make what we call the cheshben on nefesh, the introspection, self-evaluation, look ourselves in the mirror. Are we really what we, where we should be? Are we not? And the more we look and the more we see and we upgrade, and the more we upgrade, the easier it becomes and the more motivated we are to do what you, we should do. Just begin something other than that at this moment. The Chavetz Chaim cites a Gemara. The Gemara says that a person who speaks Lashon Hara, we're talking about not a person once in a while, he speaks out of turn. A person is a gossiper. He has no compunction or no hesitation to speak about other people negatively, passes judgment, and to him it's irrelevant the ramifications of what he says to the other person. And he feels he's high and mighty, so to say, and he couldn't care less the way people perceive it, the way people think it, or what it does to other people, or it gets back to the person, he is, you know, he is in that mode. That person is like, he's considered like he's a heretic. He's denying God's existence. Why? A person could almost behave without conscience. How do you never conscience? Don't you realize that there, there's a creator? There is divine retribution. There is checks and balances in life. How do you live a life without checks and balances? Well, all that makes a difference is, you know, as long as the IRS doesn't come after me, and as long as I'm not prosecuted by the government, and even that, I have enough money, I could, I could actually get a defense attorney, we could work it out somehow. This kind of person is literally a dangerous human being because he has no scruples, he'll do anything, and he could circumvent the law or go up against it because he has enough money and he has enough arrogance, enough ego, and he lives for himself. He couldn't care about society, about anybody. What would you call that person? He's real. He's a criminal. He's a criminal. You want to call it white collar crime? Call it what you want. But it's not even white collar crime. He may have the white collar, but it's crime. Serious crime. 
So a person who speaks unabashedly, uh, without any level of conscience about people, and you're a real first-class gossiper, you're considered a heretic. You deny the essence of existence, you deny a person who lives without conscience, that means there's no God in his life. The Gemara tells us that when Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, when he ate of that fruit, he was a heretic at that moment. So the Medrash tells us that before Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, the level of clarity he had, he was able to see from one end of the world to the other. There was nothing concealed from his eye, from his understanding. His level of holiness was one of a kind. He radiated radiance that the angels had mistaken his radiance for radiance of God, and therefore they sang psalm to him. But yet, when he ate of the tree of knowledge, he was a heretic. How? How's that possible? With such a level of clarity, which is one of a kind in the history of existence, when he ate of the tree of knowledge, which was good and evil, at that moment he was a heretic. So I always bring, out, bring it out with the story about Aristotle. Aristotle, the Rambam, writes about Aristotle. His level of genius was that he was able to come upon concepts that a prophet was only able to understand because it was communicated to him by God. That was the level of genius of Aristotle. So they once caught Aristotle committing adultery. So they said to Aristotle, Aristotle, how do you behave this way? He says, you're such a genius. You understand this is totally unacceptable. It's unconscionable. He says, when I committed adultery, I was not, was not Aristotle. At that moment, I wasn't Aristotle. My desire, when you go into that mode of desire, everything is blocked out because you can't do what you want if you have that in mind. The only way Adam could have eaten of the tree of knowledge, knowing God said it's forbidden. At that moment, God did not exist in his life. Only because he was able to push God out of his mind and out of his emotion, only that, that's why he could have eaten. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for him to eat with the level of clarity he had. So therefore, the Talmud says, when he ate of the tree of knowledge, it's like God did not exist at that moment. A person who speaks without any hesitation, regardless of the ramifications, the damage what he does to others, it's not part of his equation or consideration, that person is what is the equivalent of a heretic. We will continue tomorrow with Hashem's help and have everybody have a good day. Wonderful, Rabbi. Thank you. Be well. You too, Rabbi. Thank you.